The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the program. I'm your host Chris Spanos coming up on the show. The new major motion picture Kill the Messenger tells the story of Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Gary Webb. The film premieres this month in theaters across the U.S. I'll speak with staff reporter at The Intercept, Ryan Devereaux, about the life and work of Gary Webb. But first, a look at how English media report on top Latin American news. New York Times opinion writer Jonah Serra recently took aim at attorney Stephen Dozinger, who has been working to hold oil giant Chevron accountable for its human rights and environmental abuses in Ecuador's Amazonian rainforest. Dozinger has represented indigenous and farmer communities in an area of the Ecuadorian Amazon polluted by oil operations conducted by Taxico, now owned by the Chevron Corporation. In 2011, the communities won a landmark $19 billion judgment against Chevron for the cleanup of what is considered to be one of the world's worst oil-related environmental catastrophes. Nocera's column, titled Behind the Chevron Case, claims that, quote, there was another darker narrative about Dozinger, unquote. Nocera goes on to restate arguments made by Chevron that Dozinger committed multiple acts of fraud, including having members of his team ghostwrite a crucial report for the court that was supposed to be authored by an independent expert. While Dozinger's former law firm paid Chevron $15 million over alleged fraud, Dozinger himself has denied any wrongdoing. He has responded claiming that such allegations are defamatory and that they mimic key elements of Chevron's version of events. He charges that the unanimous decision handed down against the oil giant by Ecuador's Supreme Court is a legitimate judgment and has been upheld by three different courts. The blog The Chevron Pit, maintained by a team also working to hold Chevron accountable in Ecuador, points out that Nocera failed to disclose in his Times column that his wife is a lawyer and public relations director for a prominent New York litigation firm hired by none other than Chevron to work on the Ecuador environmental case. And now, let's turn to our interview. Eighteen years after it was published, journalist Gary Webb's investigative report, Dark Alliance, remains one of the most explosive and controversial exposés of U.S. journalism. The investigation explored the links between the Nicaraguan Contra rebels and the spread of cocaine within black communities in California. This past September, the CIA released documents revealing their response to Webb's investigation. And this October, the major motion picture, Kill the Messenger, which depicts Webb's story, will premiere in theaters across the U.S. Ryan Devereaux is staff reporter at The Intercept. He recently wrote the article, Managing a Nightmare, How the CIA Watched Over the Destruction of Gary Webb. He joins me now. Hello, Ryan, and welcome to Imaginary Lines. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. First, can you tell us who Gary Webb was? Yeah, absolutely. So Gary Webb was a, uh, an American journalist, uh, investigative journalist with the San Jose Mercury News. Uh, he covered corruption, government corruption, um, sort of exposed uh, officials in power um, and, and their misdeeds. He was a, he was a very... Uh, aggressive, hard-charging journalist uh, with a real skill for um, uncovering documents and, and sort of deep research in, into stories, um, who in 1996, as you said, uh, uh, wrote a series called Dark Alliance that explored the relationship between U.S.-backed uh, Contra rebels in Nicaragua fighting to overthrow the Sandinista government and uh, the drug trade to Southern California. Um, and Webb, uh, you know, through through this reporting, became became a almost a, a you know an overnight success. Um, and then and then subsequently was subject to a, a vicious attack from the nation's um, largest uh, mainstream newspapers. Um, you know, which uh, ultimately, instead of attempting to advance his story, which we can get into later, uh, you know, worked very hard to discredit him and. Um, he he was ultimately sort of uh, pushed out of uh, out of journalism, and uh, his 
his life sort of began to slowly decline after that, and uh, he took his own life in, in 2004. So let's look at the Dark Alliance, this defining investigative report of Gary's career. What did this investigation reveal, and what were its main claims? So the, the, the sort of crux of the story focused on uh, three, three main characters, two Nicaraguans living in the United States with uh, ties to the Contra fighters in Nicaragua uh, fighting the uh, Sandinistas, and the relationship that these two men had to a prominent uh, Los Angeles drug dealer named Rick Ross, otherwise known as Freeway Rick, and it explores... Uh, how these men sort of uh, came to be really uh, sort of uh, major players in the drug trade um, in La South Central Los Angeles. And, and Gary's story, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of lead of his story, the beginning of his story made some, some pretty sweeping broad claims that um, these men uh, sort of uh, were essential in, in, in triggering the explosion in crack cocaine use and abuse in the United States um, in the 1980s and the, into the 90s. And I mean, this, uh, this at that time was, was sort of the, the story. Um, crack was, uh, was used to, to gin up uh, political support and power among a, a lot of lawmakers. Um, it was used to, to sort of demonize uh, African-American communities. And, and it did have really, truly, uh, you know, the the use and abuse of crack cocaine in, in these neighborhoods and these communities was truly devastating and, and, and caused a lot of harm. So in linking this um, controversial proxy war in Central America to this devastating um, you know, drug war problem in U.S. inner cities, um, Gary Webb had penned a series that was, you know, quite clearly going to be extremely controversial. And the Washington Post um, the New York Times, and in particular the LA Times, um, really uh, aggressively sort of began to attack uh, Webb's reporting. In the case of the LA Times, you had a, a, a paper whose competitor, the San Jose Mercury News, where Gary Webb worked at, had basically scooped them in their own backyard. So the LA Times then devoted 17 reporters to, uh, you know, picking apart Gary Webb's reporting. And it's true that there were some, some, some problems with his reporting, some claims that his reporting wasn't able to fully substantiate that were largely a result of the editorial process that went into making the story. But um, th those became the focus of these papers' investigations and less so the, the broad claims that, that, that he made that were actually true involving the, the United States' relationship to a proxy army that was involved in drug, drug trafficking. What would you say are some of the lasting effects of Gary Webb's Dark Alliance? I mean, um, as, as, a, as a feat of journalism, it, this was one of the first stories to, to blow up online. You know, the way that they use primary source documents online became something that we, that we see all the time now in, in national security reporting. You know, Gary, Gary Webb, in, in his sort of initial draft of this story, of, of the Dark Alliance series, which he wanted to be, a, to be a big feature, was really a, a sort of takedown of the hypocrisy that he saw in, in the drug war. And he became a, a, a real sort of hero of, of that, you know, brand of journalism. Um, which is tr truly important and still underreported to this day. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for joining me on Imaginary Lines. Thank you for having me. And now, in other media-related news, Britain's Guardian newspaper has been accused of pro-Israel bias after publishing a widely criticized ad alleging that Palestine's Hamas is engaging in child sacrifice. The ad previously ran in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post, but was rejected by the Times in London, who called the ad too strong and too forceful for their readership. The ad was written by Eli Weisel, a Nobel Peace Laureate and Holocaust survivor. In my own lifetime, Weisel wrote, I have seen Jewish children thrown into the fire, and now I've seen Muslim children used as human shields. After publishing the ad, The Guardian reported that it had received 140 complaints from readers. The following day, it carried a letter jointly signed by leading campaigners condemning what they called the widely inaccurate and inflammatory advert. This is especially sickening, they wrote, when Israel's latest bombardment of Gaza has killed close to 400 Palestinian children. 
That's it for today's Imaginary Lines. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Please join me next week.